And I'd like to move on, and I really want to look at our phenotype data. And I think you need to do a lot of this, and I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of ways that you can look at your phenotype data. The first thing I'll point out is I'm going to use a graphics window system called Quartz. If you don't call a graphics window, your graphics will still come up, but I like Quartz and I'm going to use it. Um, on a PC, Quartz does not work. This is a Mac thing. On a PC, I like X11. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you replace Quartz with X11 uh, on your PC, it's going to work for you. So Quartz just opens a graphics window. And then I'm using this function called qplot, which is part of the ggplot package. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to qplot of glue 4, which is the four-week glucose measurement. And actually then it says facets sex twiddle dot. That's weird. Um, if you read a little bit about, or if you copy somebody else's code, you'll know, you'll learn that what facets is going to do is it's going to break my data into two parts. It's going to break it by the variable sex. So I'll actually have separate plots for males and females. And the expression sex twiddle dot tells me to stack these up vertically. If I did dot twiddle sex, it would stack them up horizontally. And if I had maybe more than one variable, I it, if I had, for example, two levels of PGM, I could do sex twiddle PGM and it would lay out a grid for me. So it's just a, a really concise way to s tell you how to lay out the plots. Um, these are details, they're not important. You can copy, you can experiment, you can try different things. You can go to the ggplot website and, and read about more things that you can try. The other thing I have to tell the qplot is where the data are because glue.4 is not in my environment. I'm going to go back to my environment for a little bit and type ls. I told you I did this a lot. And in my environment I have bxr and long.phenonames. I don't have anything called glue.4weeks, but I know that in the data bxr$pheno, this data frame has a variable called glue.4wk. So if I if I just do qplot of glue, what is it going to do? Well, you can probably read my comment and see it's going to make a histogram. The nice thing and the evil thing about ggplot is it figures out for you what kind of plot you should be drawing. Uh, I like it and I don't like it. Here goes. Um, this is what it made. I, I actually think it's it's really elegant. Um, it does all kinds of smart things for you, like put the two histograms on the same x-axis. It lines them up nicely. It gives you these background grid bars, which you can shut off if you don't like them. It also makes the plots the same height. So it's really, it's, it's broken things out by female and male for me. And it's just showing me the count in each of these different bins along the way. And what you notice here about glucose levels at four weeks is that they're pretty much about the same range in males and females. And most of them are below 200, but there's this kind of long high tail of, of glucose levels that, that go way out. Um, I know a little bit about glucose, and you will too. Um, glucose levels above 300 are overtly diabetic mice. So even at four weeks of age in this cross, we have overtly diabetic mice. This is um, this is interesting. Those long right tails are um, what I'm looking for. I just want to see the shape of the data, how it's distributed. I'm going to close that window. Um, I'm actually just going to repeat this for insulin so that you can see insulin as well. Uh, you can see that for insulin at four weeks, it's done all the, the same kind of histogram. Uh, there are a couple of more extreme outliers, but the data have that same characteristic where it kind of skews off to the right. So that's insulin. And now I'd like to show you another kind of plot. You're going to see that I'm going to make it in the same way. I'm going to I'm going to call qplot, but now I'm going to feed it two variables. I'm going to feed it glucose and insulin at four weeks. And now instead of faceting, I'm just going to color the data points by sex, and of course I have to tell qplot where the data are, and I'll do that so you can see. Um, 
that the glucose and insulin at four weeks make a big pile of points. Um, doesn't seem to be very related to one another. You can actually see the, the right skewing here. Well, there's actually a pretty easy fix for right skewing, and that is to log transform the data. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to just first call qplot with log of. So here's something you can do with qplot. You can actually do transformations of your data right in, in the command line. And I'll, I'll do that. And now you can really see on the log scale it looks more like a ball. And there's not a whole lot of correlation here. We'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. And um, here's another way. Actually, if I just call it with glue and insulin, I'm going to still color by sex. I'm just going to use this command, log equals xy, which tells me to transform the x and y axes to log scale. Two different ways to solve the same problem, I told you. They give slightly different answers, and I'll let you play with it and figure out what's different. The other thing I'm going to do, and thing I like about qplot, is I'm going to add something to it. I'm going to add something called a smooth, and I'm going to use, this is really cryptic, but this is just going to add a regression line to my plot. And the best thing to do here is just show you. Um, so there's the scatter plot again. And you can see the male regression line and the female regression line pretty much overlap each other. I would not say by eyeball method. They're probably not very different. And it's a pretty flat regression line. I would say there might be a slightly positive correlation, but eh, it's not that exciting. And that's the relationship between glucose and insulin at four weeks of age. But I was curious, so I kept going. And I plotted glucose and insulin at six weeks. And I noticed something interesting is that now I have a negative correlation, which might intuitively be what you'd expect, you know, high glucose, low insulin, maybe. And then I went to eight weeks. And wow, now there's a real strong negative relationship. And then I went to 10 weeks. And again, the strong negative relationship persists, and my log scale isn't working as nicely as it was at four weeks. You can see that the distribution of the points in my plot is a little, a little odd. In any case, um, that was just a little curiosity digression. There are, I think, 38 variables in the data set. Have all the fun you want get to know these data. And by the way, these are not all the data. It's just a little corner of a big data set um, that I went fishing through and found some good pieces for you. I'm going to look at one other just for fun. This is a really fancy command now. Uh, I'm going to plot triglycerides at 10 weeks, which is a kind of fat that's floating around in your serum, and the cholesterol. I want to separate things by sex. I want things on a log scale. I want to put those smooth lines on it, but I, I thought those pale colors were pretty hard to see. So cryptic, I want an aesthetic that colors the points by sex, but I want to use my own scale, and I want to color the male points blue and the female points red. <clears throat> and you can copy my code, and it'll work for you, and you can experiment with it, and you'll generate errors. But I really like the red and the blue points much better. I think they they stand out a little better. And um, there's a nice plot of cholesterol by triglycerides. And you can see the cholesterol between the two strains is differing, but the slopes are pretty flat, so there's really no correlation here between the two variables. Now, let's move on a little bit. I said the word correlation, so what is the correlation structure of these variables? Actually, I, I, I can look at a plot called a heat map of the correlation of the BXR phenotype data, but I only want to grab columns 7 through 38 because these are my these are my continuous variables. And R is very peculiar and picky about missing data, and I want to force R in the core command to use the complete observations, which means any row in the data that has any missing values are going to get chucked. And that, that's a little concern, but 
Let's execute the command and see what happens. Uh, everybody loves these plots. Um, in the class in the past, everybody made them over and over again. And on the side is a little dendrogram. It's the same in both. And it's, it's trying to cluster things together that are similar. And in the middle is a heat map. And a yellow score means there's a high correlation. And a red means there's a low correlation. And you can see that there are sort of these blocks along the diagonals. And they group things. And the things they group make a little bit of sense. but. I'm actually going to do some other things to the data for a moment. Uh, so I'm going to hide this and we'll come back to the correlations. And what I want to do to the data is I want to transform it. Because you might remember that some of the things I looked at already have a pretty long skew tail. And I really like my data to be bell-shaped. And we could do some detailed study of each variable one at a time and figure out whether it should be log transformed or something else. But I'm going to use somewhat of a sledgehammer. I'm going to transform all the data into normal scores. This is something we can discuss in great detail, if you wish, at some time. But basically, I'm taking the data and I'm just forcing every variable to have a bell-shaped curve. Before I destroy the data, however, I, I'm going to save a copy of it. So raw.pheno, that's my original data. There it is. I've saved it. Now I can't, I can always recover if I make a mistake. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function. And the way you define a function in R is with this assignment operator function, and then in brackets what the function should do. At the end, you have to have the return value of the function. Uh, you get a little bit of a sense. I'm, I'm going to take the rank of the data. I have to do something with ties. Um, that's weird. You could look it up in the help. Uh, something called qNorm. That's pretty cryptic. Um, I'm going to ask you to take it at face value. Copy it. Use it. So now I haven't, if I look in my environment, I'm going to have something new. And the new things, actually I have raw.pheno that I just created, and I have this rz.transform, and that's my function. So I have a new function that I can work with. And I'm going to take that function, and I'm going to replace the existing BXR phenotype data, only the continuous ones, 7 to 38. I'm going to replace those with, oh, apply. This is a very cool, very tricky R function. But what apply is going to do, it's going to apply my RZ transform function to the BXR phenotype data columns. To says columns. I'm going to transform my columns of data. If I put a 1 in there, it would transform the rows. And that would do something different that I'm not interested in doing right now. I want to apply to each column of my data the RZ transform function. And this is the slick way to do it. Now, you might, if you're a programmer, you might be inclined to write a loop at this point. Why didn't he just write for i equals 7 to 38 transform? I could. It would work. There's a lot of ways to do things in R. This data set's pretty big. It's not huge. But if I timed them, I'm going to find that the apply function is about eh, 100 times faster than the loop. Mm -hmm. And that's because R is an interpreted language. And every time you go through the loop, it has to interpret all that code. The apply function actually vectorizes the command. It just does everything at once. It's very smart. And I'm just going to stop talking about it and do it. And um, I'm going to take a quick look and see what I've done. And I'm just going to use this qplot function and apply it to one of my variables that I just transformed. And I'm going to be, oh, oh good. I'm going to remind myself what the raw phenotype data looks like. And you notice I did not stratify this by sex. I just histogrammed everything. And you can see that it's got that skew. And now I'm going to look at my transform data. And you can see that it's perfectly bell-shaped. Mm -hmm. That's what the RZ transform did. The order of the data points is still the same. But now, instead of being skewed, they're all squashed into this uh, bell-shaped normal distribution. 
I also want to um, go back and look at this uh, faceted by sex. Remind you that was our original raw data. And now I'm going to look at faceted by sex. And you'll notice that the two groups are not exactly bell-shaped anymore. They look a little odd. And that's because the bell-shaped curve has now been split up between the males and the females. It's a subtle point, but the RZ transform transformed everything regardless of whether it was male or female. And what effect that has is that it will preserve any male-female differences that exist in the original data will be preserved in the transformed data. Perhaps glucose wasn't the best example because there's not a big difference, um, but you should know that, that those differences will be preserved. And I seem to have made another plot. Oh yes, I can plot the original data, the raw.pheno, against the transformed data. And actually I can see this is a monotone function. You'll notice that there are no ups and downs. It just goes up. Uh, this is the raw data, and this is the transform data. And it's not a smooth transformation, but at least it is monotone. It preserves the order of the data. And this shape is what it takes to take my raw data and smash it into a bell-shaped curve. Um, that was a lot of plotting and looking at phenotypes, but you have to do this stuff. And I did mention that I would come back to the correlations. Now I'm going to compute the correlations on my transform data. And now I'm going to take a look at them. I notice these yellow blocks along the diagonal. They get, uh, they get a little muddy here, but there are definitely some groupings in my data that are highly correlated. And if I look and see what they are, weight and length at 6, 8, and 10 weeks. So basically the size variables of the mouse are all grouped together here. They're all correlated. That's comforting. Um, here's a couple of variables, cholesterol, HDL, and LDL. These are all the serum cholesterol measurements. You can see they're nice and highly correlated. And here's a whole bunch of things that I know are related to insulin. So all these insulin variables are correlated, at least at the 8 and 10 weeks. It falls apart at, you know, 6 weeks, and the 4 weeks is down here. And look at that, weight and length at 4 weeks. It looks like weight and length at four weeks don't have very much to do with weight and length at six, eight, and ten weeks. And you could make up some stories about that, but just think mom and gestation and then being independent and going out on your own and learning how to eat food. Um, weight and length at four weeks is a different story. Um, let me go on and say that the variables, the triglycerides, the glucose, and the here, triglycerides and glucose are all correlated with each other, a little more weakly than some of the other variables. And the NEFAs, these are the non-esterified fatty acids, so measure of uh, fat content in the serum. So I just learned a whole lot about my data. And, you know, it's not all, I was going to say, it's not all black and white. It's not all red and yellow, but it's pretty clear to me now that there's some structure to my data, and I know something about it. Um, Along the way, I, th I think I mentioned that there were some missing data, and um, I was just curious about where the missing data are and um, which variables were involved. Uh, so I just did a little quick look to see. You can see there are missing data. These NAs indicate missing data, and some of the glucose insulin variables are missing, and you can see they're missing in these nice little blocks. Apparently, mice, 20, mice number 26 and 27 missed their six-week checkup. And mice 22, 3, 4, 109, 110, etc., they must have missed their eight-week checkup. So there's some missing data, and you do have to worry about missing data. And that's why I took a look at it. And I want to point out that this cholesterol variable, that has a missing data point, too. And we'll see that come back in a minute. Um, now, I've been in this R session for quite a while, and I'm about to make a big transition to do some new things. So let's just see what's in our environment. Uh, it's not that bad, but I like to be tidy, because if you're messy in your R environment, you, you can get really confused. 
So I'm going to remove a couple of things that I know I don't need later and I'm just going to check and make sure they're gone and they're gone and actually I opened all those graphics windows and I'm just going to get rid of them and I I suppressed them but they were there and, and now they're just gone. Now oh, after all that we're finally going to get down to the business at hand and that is genome scans. <laughs>